in sports, the scoreboard doesn't tell the full story, but Netflix does. Stories about dads who happen to be world-class quarterbacks and a battle for the heart, soul, and direction of the multi-billion dollar business of F1. Whether you're a diehard fan or you're brand new, Netflix has the stories for every type of fan. You can watch these incredible sports stories like quarterback, F1 Drive to Survive, Untold, and many more now on Netflix. Apple Card is the credit card created by Apple. You earn 3% daily cash back up front when you use it to buy a new iPhone 15, AirPods, or any products at Apple. And you can automatically grow your daily cash at 4.15% annual percentage yield when you open a high-yield savings account. Apply for Apple Card in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility. Savings accounts by Goldman Sachs Bank USA. Member FDIC. Terms apply. Hello and welcome to a new podcast, The Paddock and the Pavilion with Stephen Wallace. In each show, Stephen will interview someone connected to the world of horse racing or cricket. Hello everyone. Test cricket is the focus today as I'm with former England test player Roland Butcher to chat about England's recent test series with New Zealand and the first test between West Indies and South Africa in St Lucia. Welcome back to The Paddock and the Pavilion, Roland. How are you? Stephen, it's a great pleasure to be back, and um, I'm fine. Good to hear you. How, how's Barbados with COVID? Well, Barbados is coping pretty well. Um, you know, our figures now, certainly this week, we went a couple of days with no uh, positive cases. Last week, one on a particular day, maybe two. So, you know, certainly trending down and going in the right direction. Well, that's good news. And you've been on granddad duties today, haven't you? Yeah, well, my grandson, he's obviously, he's here with us, um, you know, so I have to, I mean, he's no kid. I mean, he's nearly 19, so he's fine. But uh, I certainly stay in touch with my son in UK, um, who has um, a young son. I mean, he's probably about 15 months or so. So obviously we chat quite a lot. And is your grandson a sportsman as well? He was. He was into judo. Um, no longer into judo. He's quite a big lad for a um, 19 year old. You know, he's, you know, about six foot five and, and pretty big. So, you know, he was certainly, he was a good, he was very good at judo. Um, but he broke his leg um, while uh, preparing for the Junior Commonwealth Games. And um, following that, they would have had the Junior Olympics as well. But having broken his leg, he was out for a a full year and after that I really tried to encourage him to go back but really he was not really interested and eventually you know just gave it up which was unfortunate but he was pretty good. Right well let's start with England who were beaten 1-0 by a talented group of Kiwi test cricketers. How impressed were you with New Zealand? Well New Zealand um, Stephen as you know one of my sides in terms of how they've developed over the years. I mean, I think now they're a pretty competent team in all departments, you know, batting, bowling, fielding, very professional outfit, very fit. And, you know, I, you know, I tipped probably in the last time we spoke, you know, I said then that I fancy New Zealand really to be, to be world champions. Um, so they're a very, very competitive side. And, you know, England, who... We're going to have changes to their side. Um, would have struggled even if they had a good side um, out against New Zealand because I think New Zealand now really are playing cricket, um, very very good cricket, and they've got a good bench in terms of reserves. And the guys in the team obviously have to perform because the reserves are waiting. So they've got strength in depth and depth, and really they are a very good outfit. Well, you talked then about the England, uh, England side and um, selection. What did you think of the England selection? Well, um, in terms of England selection, um, I didn't look at it too closely in terms of whether people were not selected or people were not available or people were being rested. But if you look at the teams that actually played, um, you wouldn't say that they were England's strongest teams. Um, obviously, you had the likes of Archer missing and... Um, Ben Stokes, you had Joss Butler. I'm not sure the reason why um, someone like Johnny Bairstow was was missing, but obviously 
those players are, are key players to the team. And it really, it left the batting a little bit short, uh, particularly when you haven't played a lot of cricket. So, um, obviously, New Zealand are a very good ball inside and, you know, just exposed the, the, the lineup. Yeah, and the England side now is selected just by one person. Now, Chris Silverwood, what, Silverwood, what do you think to one person selecting the England team? For me, it's quite a strange um, thing to happen. You know, I always believe that you need some object, somebody who's objective um, outside of that. I mean, I think as coach, you know, you're, you're just too close to the players, you know, and then you have to make judgments um, on those players in terms of whether they're selected. You know, it, it really gives an opportunity for a conflict of interest because if, for instance, um, you're the coach and I'm a player and, you know, we have a bust up in the nets for whatever reason, um, you know, it is possible or it can be seen as if I'm not selected that the reason for that is that because you are holding some sort of grudge because of you know the chat that we that we had, so I not a, I'm not in favour of it of having the coach being the lone selector because I think it also puts him under um, a lot of unnecessary pressure. And um, at the end of the day, then really, you know, he he has to concentrate on so many things. No longer is he only concentrating on preparing the team and the tactics, etc. During the game. You know, he, he now has to also concentrate uh, very clearly to, to understand whether he has um, picked the, the right side or not. Yeah, so, so, so basically the, the problem with that particular exercise is that as a coach, you know, you really should be concerned with getting those players ready for the game itself and actually what happens throughout the game with the tactics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, if during the, the test match you have to be wondering, you know, did I make the right selection? Um, you know, it can take your mind off the job at hand. I, I don't like it. And perhaps someday I will find out why England decided to go in that direction. Yeah, it's not a path we've, we've trod before. I mean, when Ray Illingworth effectively became... Uh, the same sort of scenario as we've got now. But as a rule, we've always had selectors and, and sort of scouts as well. I think we've still got scouts now, but there's one person picking the team. Yeah, well, there's the real and worst situation didn't work out too well, did it? No. <laughs> there was there was some um, sort of problems then with, with Devon in particular, I think. Uh, and in the first, well, in both tests, actually, we didn't play a spinner. Do you yourself like to see a spinner I mean, you know Lords really well. In the first test, we didn't play a spinner, and Edgbaston is normally a uh, ground where you need a spinner. Yeah, I guess maybe they looked at the surfaces. Surfaces. Maybe they thought it's early in the season and there wouldn't be much turn. Um, but I think if England did have a quality spinner, a Graham Swan, um, you know, regardless of the circumstances, he would have played. I think it probably made them made it a little bit easier for them not to play a spinner because right now they don't have that quality of a spinner in the setup that it would be almost embarrassing to drop. So when they leave out, you know, Bess or Leach, you know, really, you know, Joe Root can at this stage can do a, a similar job. And you know, if the pitches were not going to turn um, a great deal, then you can understand. And it also you know, begs the question, um, Moin Ali, what's the position with Moin Ali? Is he, is he out of favour? Is he not interested in playing test cricket? Um, is he just not selected? Because, you know, he would have been someone who would have fitted the bill very well and he would have added um, some sort of stability also to the lower order as well. Yeah, I think with the IPL players, they made a decision not to include them in the two tests but there was lots of talk over here that um bracy who people have said is possibly the 10th best wicketkeeper in the country was was playing in a test match and yet um uh butler and uh Bester were both playing in the blast during the test match yeah, it is it is it is it's quite strange i mean i i always believe that you know you shouldn't try to play your strongest team um 
you know, Butler and others really haven't played a lot of test cricket recently. You know, it's only a, a two test series. So really, you know, it would have been for me important for those players to have played and, you know, to get some form, you know, for the rest of the summer. But obviously they chose not to. Maybe it's the new thinking um, of the the selector. It's the new thinking that maybe, you know, we don't pick these players. But it seemed a very strange situation to, to have. Well, thank you for those thoughts. I mean, the other big news before the start of the test match was the uh, the situation with Ollie Robinson with some offensive tweets that he'd made eight and nine years ago. And what were your thoughts on... Uh, his suspension and the actual situation and the action taken? Well, I think what I would say, first and foremost, um, what Robinson wrote cannot be accepted at, at any time, whether it was nine years ago or now. I mean, it, I, I think it's unacceptable what he wrote. But I, I do have some sympathy for him because, you know, he became a professional cricketer before 2021. And for this to only surface on the day of his first test match suggests to me that it is something that was held for that, for that moment. That I cannot agree with. Um, this really should have been out in the open years ago. It would have been dealt with there and then by the club and the ECB and everyone else. And on the first day of his test match, we wouldn't have this whole thing blowing up. And then to subsequently um, suspend him afterwards, I, I, I can't really agree with that as well. I mean, basically, you know, he, he has accepted what he's done is wrong. Uh, it happened when he was an 18-year-old. You know, we've all made some mistakes as 18-year-olds. Obviously, there's always, a pay, there's always a price to pay. I don't have a problem paying the price. But the timing of... This thing coming out suggests to me uh, more of a conspiracy than than anything else, and um, that's the thing that I'm not really in favour of um, the, the timing of this release. There's now an inquiry, and um, I heard Michael Holden say that it was important that there was a proper inquiry, which established that he had changed as a person and didn't have those thoughts um, like he had when he was 18, 19. But the inquiry didn't take too long. Well, I'm not sure what they, what are they going to inquire about. I mean, if you ask me, are you the same person as you were as an 18 year old? I say no. Um, I mean, have they got the resources to to go all over the world to find out whether I have changed as a person um, since I was 18 years of age? Uh, it seems to me. The whole investigation thing, I, I don't quite understand that. If you have already decided that you're going to suspend him, um, you know, suspend him. Not, not suspend him pending an investigation. You've suspended him. So give him the punishment, whatever it is. Um, let him set out the punishment, you know, and get back to playing cricket. I, I don't really see why you need to um, continue to... to into a further investigation, it makes no sense to me. Right. Well, thanks for those thoughts. We'll move on to the to the actual the actual first Test match, uh, where New Zealand batted first, got 378, and Dean Conway got 200 last man out run out. What did you think to his performance? Well, Conway's performance was outstanding, but it it didn't surprise me. Um, and and what he will do in the game will not surprise me because I've, I took an interest in Conway some time ago. And basically, a friend of mine in South Africa by the name of Sean Belugi told me um, almost two years ago that keep an eye out for this guy, Devon Conway, who was, uh, you know, he played for us class cricket in South Africa when he was 18, um, got some good scores, didn't fulfill his, his promise, then took the opportunity to go to New Zealand. And he said to me, Keep an eye out for this guy because he's something special. So I certainly started to watch him from that point and, you know, notice very clearly the amount of runs that he scores in, in New Zealand. You know, so he didn't get picked by New Zealand um, as a chance player. You know, he 
for two or three years, he topped the batting averages in New, in New Zealand in first class, 50 over, and T20. You know, that takes some doing. You know, you get, you get most players who right, top the averages in one. But he topped them in all for about two or three seasons. So that tells you that here is a guy, you know, who has an appetite for scoring runs and scoring big runs. So his performances didn't surprise me at all. Well, back back to uh, uh, Ollie Robinson. He was England's most impressive bowler, actually, in the match. But in the first innings, he got four wickets. And some some people sort of compared him to someone that you played with a lot, Angus Fraser, with his height and the bounce he got. Yeah, I think he's, you know, he, 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 there's a bit about him. Um, I think he's perhaps a bit more aggressive than Angus. Um, and when I say aggressive, I mean, Angus was aggressive as a person, but um, not frighteningly aggressive as a bowler. What Angus had was um, immacul- immaculate control of line and length. Um, he didn't vary from that. Um, he had good stamina, but Angus would just do things over and over again. I, I think Robinson differs a little bit in that. You know, I think he's got, looks as if he's got the ability to step it up as well. He's got some of the good Angus Fraser habits. Um, but he would also tell you that he's perhaps a better batsman than Angus. So uh, at this moment in time, you know, things look look good for him. Yeah, he did get 40 runs in England's first innings. And England replied with 275. Tim Southey getting six wickets. Um, I try to forget day three because for the last, I think, three weeks, we haven't had any rain. And that was the day I decided to go to Lords. So... I went all the way on the train to Lords and watched it rain until two o'clock when I decided to come home. Um, but in- England were then set uh, a target by Kane Williamson in 273 to win in 75 overs. Did you think England should have had made more of an attempt to get the runs? No, I don't. Um, and the reason I say that is that, you know, you were in the first test match, um, I don't think there was any need for England to make any unnecessary changes, any and you know, and, and go chasing after um, a total like that. Uh, Wild people may think yes, it's probably gettable, but I would think New Zealand would have more chance of winning the game um, with England forcing the pace. So obviously they chose the opportunity to get some some bad in practice, and you know it, ter- it petered out really to to be on a team draw. Had the third day not been rained out, I think you would have had a, a very good game of cricket because I think New Zealand would have set a stiffer target, given them more time. And then England would have had to either go for the runs or try to bat time out. And um, with another half a day to bat out, it may have been very, very difficult. But in the circumstances, I, I have no difficulty with um, the way England decided not to chase. And of course, with England not having uh, Butler and Stokes, that obviously must have made a lot of difference to a to a possible chase. Well, absolutely. I mean, you've got you know if you've only got to look through the batting lineup, and you see there are so many newcomers to Test cricket um, in that middle order. You know, even the likes of Burns and and, and Sibley who've played a number of Tests are not hugely experienced, and perhaps you know they're not experienced at chasing targets for a start. And when then when, when you add, you know, likes of Crawley, Pope and Lawrence and you know, they're all all young players trying to find their way. Um, you know, so really it would have been a, a tall axe to ask those guys to to come out and chase down that total. And then the second test we moved on to uh, Edgbaston. We had a crowd of eighteen thousand. It was a test event, so there was a, a lot of noise in the Eric Holly stand. New Zealand made six changes, no no Kane Williamson. Um, Ollie Stone was uh, selected on his home ground and Jimmy Anderson was making his record 162 test match appearance. Uh, Quite an achievement for a bowler to play that many test matches. Absolutely. I mean, it it really speaks to his longevity. You know, a a batsman playing 162 test matches is understandable, but an opening bowler playing that amount of test matches really is something very special and it really is testament to the way Jimmy Anderson is not only performed as a cricketer but you know the way he has really looked after his body and ensure that even at this late stage in his career 
but he still has the energy, the stamina and the skill uh, to perform at this high level. So, you know, congratulations to him because that really is a fantastic perf performance to have come so far. Um, you know, when you start out to play this game, you know, you, you, you hope to play international cricket and you never ever think that you would play that amount of cricket, particularly as a fast bowler, where the chances of getting injured are so great that he's been able to, you know, to continue and still be considered when England picked their first choice team. So that is testament to, to, to him. Well, even with six changes, um, I mean, England, England got 303. The New Zealand, two new bowlers in Trent Bolt was back from the IPL, got four wickets. Matt Henry got three wickets. And then when New Zealand batted, Conway again with 80, uh, Will Young with 82 and uh, Ross Taylor with 80. They got a first in his lead. Um, did you then expect England to get bowled out for 122? Well, I, I felt that England really would lose the test match. But getting back to the New Zealand side, the fact that they made six changes would make no difference to their team because their bench strength is so strong that the players who come in for rested or injured or, or loss of form players can do the job. So the fact that, you know, those six players came in, I don't think it would have made any difference. Their, their bench is very, very strong. And, you know, in more sports, as you know, if you've got a strong bench, you know, you invariably have a strong team. So, you know, Man City is testimony to that. So, you know, once England didn't get, you know, over 400, you know, New Zealand had the batsmen certainly to get on par and, and get, a, you know, and get ahead of the game. And, you know, this young England side at the moment struggling to bat well twice. So there was always the likelihood of, of some collapse in the second innings. So having got 300 in the first innings, I really didn't see that they would get 300 in the second innings. Well, yeah, in the second innings, we collapsed to 76 for seven. And our top scorer was uh, Mark Wood with 29. Yeah, at that stage, really, the game was, it was all about up. You know, you can't recover from a position like that with just tail enders to come. So, you know, the job was an easy one, perhaps. I, I was surprised that it was quite so easy. But I, I always felt that they would be second best. And England's batting woes, are they down to young players? Uh, is it poor technique, poor shots? I mean, you've said before that it's not just down to people playing T20 cricket because you've said before that Kane Williamson can play a T20 game and then he can play a test match and get 250. Yes, it's about adapting to the, the, the different types of games, um, adapting to the conditions, you know, and, you know, someone like Kane Williamson, you know, I, I go back to Kane Williamson because... You know, Keir Williamson during the West Indies tour of New Zealand a few months ago, um, Williamson came back from, uh, I think, playing the IPL or he was playing the T20 tournament anyway. And without playing a game, his first innings uh, was in the first test match. You know, and he made 250 on a green top. Uh, that wasn't easy for him, but what you saw was you know, a top-class player who knows how to survive even in tough conditions. Really, I don't think England at the moment, amongst their younger players, um, they're learning the game, so they don't really have that sort of ability to adapt, you know, that quickly. And, you know, when these guys are not playing, you know, county cricket, you know, I, I, I like to feel that when you come into a game, you know, you come into a game with form. But as you know, these days, uh, the guys who play international cricket really don't play much for their counties at all. Um, and at times, I think that's a lost opportunity because, you know, to get some runs in county cricket certainly would hold you in good stead, you know, when you play in the test match, uh, you know, the following week. But... You know, England's, England batting lineup. Uh, the, you know, they're young. They're players who have shown promise. Um, those young players have shown promise, but obviously they're not the finished article yet. And we've said earlier in this podcast, you 
can't forget the uh, the talent of the New Zealand bowlers with Trent Bolt, uh, Matt Henry, uh, Neil Wagner, Tim South. They're very good bowlers. Yeah, terrific bowlers. And you didn't mention Kyle Jemison, who really has been the standout um, performer for them the last couple of years. I mean, he he has now made that team, you know, so so strong by being a top all rounder. Um, you know, someone who gets wickets, he can keep it tight. Uh, he, he gets the ball to bunks alarmingly and, and he's handy with the bat. So he, he has made them a much more resolute side in the last couple of years. So, you know, their bowling attack is is excellent. And in English conditions, which are similar to New Zealand conditions these days, where the pitches are green and, and, and there's grass on the pitch, you know, he really, Jameson forms part of a, a very potent bowling attack. And of course, England are going to have the same sort of problems when they're facing their next two opponents, India and Australia, who've also got very good uh, fast bowling attacks. Yeah, more of the same. You know, uh, you know, India. You know, India have got very good bowlers in in English conditions. Well, I mean, in most conditions, but the type of seam bowlers that they have certainly will relish um, playing in English conditions. Um, you know, I think England will have to be at the top of their game. Uh, when they play against India, particularly from a batting perspective, you know, if they really want to stay in the contest. And, you know, the England, the Indian bowlers certainly will enjoy um, bowling in England this summer. Obviously, it wouldn't be as hot in terms of the sweltering heat. And, you know, they'd be able to bowl much longer spells. So I think the England batting, the batters have got their work cut out for the rest of the summer. Yeah, because the the Indian tests start in early August, so we could have conditions that, if we have a, a dry period, that could suit the Indian, you know, bowlers, you know, fast bowlers and uh, spin bowlers as well. Well, certainly, because as you know, um, while August is always a, a good month for batting, um, generally the pitches in in August usually offer the spinners some assistance. So. You know, that again will be playing into the hands of of India. Um, we saw what happened when England played India um, this winter, albeit on different pitches. But, you know, the Indian spinners, you know, they're still very good spinners. And I think they present a real contest for, for England this summer. And we've mentioned Jimmy Anderson before, but him and Stuart Broad, do you think going forward they can play together or will they need to be rotated during the summer the best thing the best thing perhaps going forward with when everybody's available uh, would be for them to be part of the rotation process um, play both of them if you've got archer available if you've got wood available if you've got um, robinson available if you've got wilkes available um, to play both of them it means that Perhaps two of those, two or three of those, will not play. So I can't really see going forward unless England have got injury worries or loss of form worries to see both of them playing together. I, I suspect that you know they will be pretty much part of the bench strength now. Uh, I think that's going to be their role going forward. Yeah, it, it is one area where England, with their uh, fast bowlers, have got a. Good, good combination of fast bowlers who they can rotate and keep fit. Yeah, you know, and, and to have two guys as part of that rotation who have got over a thousand um, test wickets, I mean, that, that really speaks volumes. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's time to cast them out because, you know, they're still sure that, that they can perform. Perhaps they will not be as prolific as early in their career, but I think they can still make a meaningful contribution. And, um, you know, it, it argues well for England to, to have that sort of strength in depth. Well, let's turn to uh, matters in St Lucia. Was it, is it more gloomy for the West Indies than England? Well, that's, <laughs> that's a very good question, Stephen. Um, I certainly believe that before the series that this was going to be a serious examination of just how much West Indies have improved over the the last six months. No disrespect to Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. I think to win in Bangladesh was a fantastic performance because 
you know, even good teams go to Bangladesh and, and don't win. So to go to Bangladesh with a so-called depleted side, because, as you know, a number of the star players elected not to go. Um, but they went with a lot of new players who perform exceptionally well on the new captain and got the desired result within the Test Series. So that was a fantastic result, albeit in, you know, more um, batting-friendly conditions because you don't have the fast bowlers. Now, the matches against uh, Sri Lanka, again, Sri Lanka came here um, just really with one very good fast bowler, and he was outstanding, um, Max Mal. I mean, he really bowled superbly. I mean, belied his age. Uh, but he was pretty much on his own. He got a bit of support from Shamira, but I think generally they didn't have the pace and the pitches were not um, good for fast bowling. But St. Lucia, which we know, uh, nobody has to tell us that the pitches in St. Lucia are usually green, uh, fast, bounce, there is movement and you know, over the, la- over the years, we know that that's the case. So against a South African attack, really, with a very, very good attack led by Rabada and Gidi, um, Nortke, you know, you've got three very, very fine bowlers in conditions that they're very familiar with because they're used to playing in those conditions in South Africa. Um, exact conditions, green wickets, pace and bounce. And they have proven at test level that, you know, they can deliver. So really, I always expected that West Indies would have it pretty tough uh, because, again, you know, you've got, say, team players in the team who are playing their third and fourth test matches um, in those conditions who would be severely tested. And that proved to be the case in the first test. Yeah, and for listeners, the... Uh... The West Indies uh, lost the match by an innings, innings and 63 runs in the first innings, were bowled out for 97, and Jason Holder top scoring, I think, with 20. But when West Indies bowled, you did have South Africa 233 for eight, and then they finished up getting another nearly another 100 runs, didn't they? They did, and that was mainly down to Quentin de Kock, who really played a fantastic hand. But before then, you know, South Africa put together some good partnerships. I think Markham at the top of the order uh, made 60-odd. Took a long time to get it, but batted really well, laid the laid foundation. Same thing with Van der Dissen. He did exactly the same thing. Fell just short of a half century, but batted a long, long time. And really, what they did was, you know, they, they wore West Indies down to some degree because West Indies really went into this test match with three three fast bowlers, one on, one on debut, and, you know, Kyle Mears is the backup seamer. So, really, there was a lot of work for the seamers. And at the point in time, as you said, when they were eight down, when you really needed some fresh legs um, to dislodge the, the last two wickets, they just didn't have it. And um, the caught grew in confidence. He, he, he got um, Noki to hang around with him. And really played a fantastic innings in the end, and it turned out to be a match winning innings. You mentioned uh, a young man making his debut, Jaden Seals. He looked impressive, though. Yes, I think Seals Seals bowled pretty well. Um, you know, I think if you look at the overall game, you know, he had a, a good early part of, of the Test match where he had uh, one stage three for twenty odd, um, finished up with his same three for about seventy five. So when you look. And, and analyze over the, the test match, you saw a bit of promise. Um, you know, obviously, this was his second really first class game. He's played one other first class game before this. So he's got a lot to learn at this level. And, you know, he, he, he's going to have to learn quickly because, you know, West Indies do not have um, a lot of time because, you know, following this series, in the region here, you've got um, Australia and Pakistan. So, you know, he's going to have to learn quickly and as quickly as this next test match. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what happens on Friday. So are there any changes to the West Indies team, you know? Or? 
we haven't heard any changes yet. I, I would expect that there would be some changes. Um, in the first test for me, I think they got it slightly wrong in that there was no need for two spinners in St. Lucia. I mean, the pitch is not going to turn appreciably. Um, they had two spinners in Chase and Cornwall, and that really hurt them in the end because they really needed another fast bowler to take some of the load off the other fast bowlers that didn't have one. So I would suspect that in this next test match, unless something miraculous happened in the next couple of days in terms of the pitch, that you know Cornwall would make way, I would imagine, for Joseph. The next thing would be uh, that you know Bonner, who was out with concussion, uh, not sure whether he's going to be available. So if he's not available, uh, it allows um, Kieran Powell, who had to open in the second innings, obviously because Bonner was was injured for him to continue in the team as an opener. And then maybe the other position that they may have to look at would be the position of, of Blackwood, whether he deserves to be given another game or whether they look at someone like Darren Bravo, who's also in the 17. So, you know, those are the, the things that could happen between now and Friday that they decide to make those changes. Oh, we'll look out for those. But some some good news, um, well, from England's point of view and for West Indies, actually, following the West Indies trip to England last summer, is that we're now, England are now playing three tests against the West Indies in early two, 2022. Yeah, that's good news for the, for the West Indies. Um, you know, that England are coming to the region and have increased the number of test matches that they're going to play. As you know, they come first of all for a one-day series, then come back a month or so later um, for the test series. So, you know, it is good news for the Caribbean and it's good news for the people of the Caribbean. Hopefully, this whole COVID situation would have eased by then and people will be allowed back into the stadiums to watch cricket. At the moment, as you know, the matches are taking place um, with no spectators. I think that's currently going to be the position with both Australia and Pakistan in the, in July, unless things obviously change radically between now and then. But hopefully when England come in January, that the situation will be such that um, spectators who have had to sit out for nearly two years um, not being able to physically go to a, a ground to watch a test match will be able to do so. Yeah, I'm sure members of the Barmy Army will li- like to come out to the Caribbean in the 2022 after such a long time away from from watching Test cricket. Well, I think the Barmy Army will come even if they can't get into the ground. So, you know, that 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 is um, a definite. We're also at a time a lot of sporting events uh, on at the moment. Yeah, I think you've mentioned already in the podcast, you, you think that New Zealand will beat India in the World Test Championship final? That's where my money is if I was betting um, on this competition. I, yeah, I, I fancy New Zealand because when you think of the strength of the New Zealand side, no disrespect to India, but also the bad luck that New Zealand has had to endure at various, various times in the last couple of years, I believe that the time is right now for things to go right for them. So I'm firmly back in New Zealand to win the, the one-off test. Yeah, they do. They do do a, a major championship win. I mean, but actually, in the World Cup, although it's fifty overs, they did beat India in the semi-final. Yes, they did. But then we saw what happened in the final and how yeah, it they happened. Ran, so, they they ran out of luck there. They certainly ran out of luck, but they ran out of luck um, not not through their own making. It just so happened the way things worked out. But I think they drew some good luck and. Um, and they would would have deserved it because I think they really have been a credit to to Test cricket, and it really what they've shown the other countries is that you don't have to be necessarily be the so-called one of the big boys, but 
you know, you can punch above your weight. And as you know, New Zealand have punched above their weight for many years. And I think they deserve now to be recognised as a top team. Well, credit to them. We're a country of five million people, six first-class teams. If they can beat uh, India, that'll be a major achievement. And thoroughly deserved. And as a football fan and a coach, what, what's your uh, thoughts on the European football championships which are going on at the moment? I've tuned in um, from time to time and it's good to see that um, spectators are able to watch football again because, as you know, you know, we really haven't had a lot of spectatorship at, at sporting events for a long time. And I understand the new stadium yesterday that was in, in Hungary that was built particularly for these Euros had some 60,000 people. So, you know, that was fantastic. And also set up around the country, you know, they had some f- fan zones set up with huge um, screens and thousands and thousands of people watching. So, you know, you know, I think Euros is something, obviously, that we were looking for since last year. Um, couldn't happen. But, you know, you've got some good sides in there and, 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 some, and some good players. And I, I will certainly follow it um, through and, and see how it goes. There's some good sides in there. I think, you know, the likes of France and Belgium and you know, Portugal got off to a good good start as well. And, of course, England got a win as well. So is this the year when England actually do well in a major championship? We'll have to wait and see. Oh, so where do you think England will reach then? Well, I, I think I, I really fancy them to get as far as the semi-final. Um, I think it's been too long without them really reaching deep into these tournaments. And this year, I feel if the draws work out well, that they could get as far as the semi-final. And then once you get there, then anything can happen. Well, that's a good note to uh, come to a conclusion. Thanks again for joining me on the paddock and the pavilion. Hopefully speak to you again after England's five test series against uh, India in mid-late September. Well, Stephen, you know, it's always a great pleasure and um, I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you to you and, and also to congratulate Ebony on, on her award. Um, I think it is, it is fantastic and as you would have spoken to her at some point in time, I'm sure you're probably going to speak to her again, but um, I, I really want to congratulate her on, on what um, she has achieved and, um, you know, and hope that going forward, you know, that she, she can certainly do a lot more um, for the good of cricket. Yes, the ACE programme seems to be going from strength to strength, now moving to move to uh, Birmingham. And I heard her on the radio talking about it possibly going to Bristol as well. Yes, I mean, I, I would certainly like to see that in time, you know, those major cities that have a, a large concentration of black, pe- black people, like Reading, you know, Bristol, as you said, Birmingham, you're already in London, um, you know, so those those sort of areas, I think it is well worth expanding um, into those areas and try to give people the opportunity to, to reach for the stars. And, that, and that's really what you're aiming to do. Certainly. Well, that's an even better note to thank you again for being on the Paddock and the Pavilion. Great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Paddock and the Pavilion. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and now on Instagram, at the Pad and Pav. Don't forget, if you like the show, please do leave us a rating and review. Sports Social Podcast Network. We all know a guy who only occasionally shaves for big occasions, and it's because that occasional shave really hurts. It's the time of year for big occasions, and yet there he is, suffering with that cheap drugstore razor. Let's help him out. Henson Shaving's line of razors, built with aerospace precision, deliver a smooth shave your dad, brother, and even son can enjoy, eventually. With replacement blades just 10 cents each, you'll buy it once, and they'll use it for life. How's that for the perfect gift? Celebrate with 100 free blades on your first purchase, and no subscription headaches. HensonShaving.com slash holiday.